This is due to mainly something we call Moore's Law. Gordon Moore is one of the founders of Intel Corporation, which makes 75% of the integrated processors used in PCs. In 1965, Moore predicted that computer processing power would double and that its cost would drop by 50% every two years. Raw data are facts and figures. Researchers have made the distinction between raw data and information. However, raw data consists of fact or figures. Information is useful data that influences someone's choices or behavior. One way to think about the difference between data and information is that information has context. In today's hyper-competitive business environments, information is as important as capital or money for business success, whether it's about product inventory, pricing, or cost. It takes money to get businesses started, but businesses can't survive and grow without the right information. First mover advantage is the strategic advantage that companies earn by being the first in an industry to use new information technology to substantially lower cost or to differentiate a product or service from that of its competitors. Companies that use information technology to establish first mover advantage usually have higher market shares and profits. Companies need to address three critical questions to sustain a competitive advantage through information technology. First, does the information technology create value for the firm by lowering costs or providing a better product or service? If an information technology doesn't add value, then investing in it would put the firm at a competitive disadvantage relative to companies that choose information technology that add value. Second, is information technology the same or different across competing firms? If all firms have access to the same information technology and use it in the same way, then no firm has an advantage over one another. That is, there's competitive parity. Third, is it difficult for another company to create or buy the information technology used by the firm? If so, then the firm has established a substantial competitive advantage over competitors through information technology. If not, the competitive advantage is just temporary, and competitors should eventually be able to duplicate the advantage the leading firm has gained from information technology. In short, the key to sustaining a competitive advantage is not faster computers, more memory, or larger hard drives. Information is useful when it's accurate. Before relying on information to make decisions, you must know that the information is correct, but what if it isn't? Information is useful when it's complete. Incomplete or missing information makes it difficult to recognize problems and identify potential solutions. You can have complete, accurate information, but it's not very useful if it doesn't pertain to the problems you're facing. Finally, information is useful when it's timely. To be timely, the information must be available when needed to define a problem or to begin to identify possible solutions. If you've ever thought, I wish I would have known that earlier, then you understand the importance of timely information and the opportunity and cost of not having it. Acquisition cost is the cost of obtaining data that you don't have. Companies often have a massive amount of data, but not in the form or combination they need. Processing cost is the cost of turning raw data into usable information. A data silo is an isolated data set that's difficult to obtain, combine, or use with other company data. Data silos often have high processing costs because of data variety, that is, data that are formatted or structured in different ways. Making differently formatted and structured data, such as numbers, words, pictures, and social media compatible is difficult and costly. Storage cost is the cost of physically or electronically archiving information for later retrieval and use. Retrieval cost is the cost of accessing already stored and processed information. One of the most common misunderstandings about information is that it's easy and cheap to retrieve after the company has it. That's not so. First, you have to find the information. Then, you have to go convince whoever has it to share it with you. Then, the information has to be processed into a form that's useful for you. Communication cost is the cost of transmitting information from one place to the other. 
there are two basic methods of capturing information, manual and electronic. Manual capture of information is a slow, costly, labor-intensive, and often inaccurate process which entails recording and entering data by hand into a data storage device. To avoid the problems inherent with such a system, organizations are relying more on electronic capture. They use electronic storage devices such as barcodes, radio frequency identification, known as RFID tags, and document scanners to capture and record data electronically. Barcodes represent numerical data by verifying the thickness and pattern of vertical bars. The primary advantage of barcodes is that the data they represent can be read and recorded in an instant with a handheld or pens type scanner. Radio frequency identification tags or RFID tags contain minuscule microchips that transmit information via radio waves and can be used to track the number and location of the objects into which the tags have been inserted. Electronic scanners, which convert printed text and pictures into digital images, have become an increasingly popular method of capturing data electronically because they're inexpensive and easy to use. The first requirement for a good scanner is a document feeder that automatically feeds document pages into the scanner or turns the pages, often with a puff of air, when scanning books or bound documents. Text that has been digitalized cannot be searched or edited like regular text in your word processing software. However, the second requirement for a good scanner is an optical character recognition software to scan and convert documents. Processing information means transforming raw data into meaningful information that can be applied to business decision making. One promising tool to help managers dig out from under the avalanche of data is data mining. Data mining is the process of discovering patterns and relationships in large amounts of data. Data mining is carried out using complex algorithms such as neural networks, rule induction, and decision trees. If you don't know what those are, that's okay. With data mining, you don't have to. Most managers only need to know that data mining looks for patterns that are already in the data but are too complex for them to spot on their own. Data mining typically splits a data set in half, finds patterns in one half, and then tests the validity of those patterns by trying to find them again in the second half of the data set. The data typically come from data warehouses, which store huge amounts of data that have been prepared for data mining analysis by being cleared of errors and redundancy. The data in a data warehouse can then be analyzed using two types of data mining. Supervised data mining usually begins with the user telling the data mining software to look for and test for a specific pattern and relationship in the data set. Typically, this is done through a series of what-if questions or statements. By contrast, with unsupervised data mining, the user simply tells the data mining software to uncover whatever patterns and relationships it can find in a data set. Association or affinity patterns occur when two or more database elements tend to occur together in a significant way. Sequence patterns appear when two or more database elements occur together in a significant pattern in which one of the elements precedes the other. Predictive patterns are just the opposite of association or affinity patterns. While association or affinity patterns look for database elements that seem to go together, predictive patterns help identify database elements that are different. Data clusters are the last kind of pattern found by data mining. Data clusters occur when three or more database elements occur together, that is, in a cluster in a significant way. Traditionally, data mining has been very expensive and very complex. Today, however, data mining services and analysis are much more affordable and within the reach of most company budgets. And if it follows the path of most technologies, data mining will become even easier and cheaper to use in the future. Protecting information is the process of ensuring that data are reliably and consistently retrievable in a usable format for authorized users, but no one else. 
People inside and outside companies can steal or destroy company data in various ways, including web server attacks, viruses and malware, spyware or adware, keystroke monitoring, password cracking, and pinching. Numerous steps can be taken to secure data and data networks. Some of the most important are authentication and authorization, firewalls, antivirus software for PCs and email servers, data encryption, virtual private networks, and updating and patching outdated software. We'll review those steps and then finish this section with a brief review of the dangers of wireless networks. Two critical steps are required to make sure that data can be accessed by authorized users and no one else. One is authentication, that is, making sure users are who they claim to be. The other is authorization, that is, granting authenticated users approved access to data, software, and systems. Many companies are now turning to two-factor authentication, which is based on what users know, such as a password, and what they have in their possession, such as a secure ID card, their phones, or unique information that only they would know. When logging in, users are first asked for their passwords, but then they must provide a second authentication factor, such as an answer to a security question that is unique information, or a validation code that's been sent to their mobile phone. Unfortunately, stolen or cracked passwords are not the only way for hackers and electronic thieves to gain access to an organization's computer resources. Unless special safeguards are put in place, every time corporate users are online, there's literally nothing between their PCs and the internet. Home users with high-speed internet access face the same risks. Hackers can access files, run programs, and control key parts of computers if precautions aren't taken. To reduce these risks, companies use firewalls, hardware, or software devices that sit between the computer and the internal organizational network and outside networks such as the internet. Firewalls filter and check incoming and outgoing data. A virus is a program or a piece of code that, without your knowledge, attaches itself to other programs on your computer and can trigger everything from a harmless flashing message to the reformatting of your hard drive to a system-wide network shutdown. Antivirus software for PCs scans emails, downloaded files and computer hard drives, disk drives, and memory to detect and stop computer viruses from doing damage. However, this software is effective only to the extent that users of individual computers have and use up-to-date versions. Corporate antivirus software automatically scans email attachments such as Microsoft Word documents, graphics, or text files as they come across the company email server. Data encryption transforms data into complex, scrambled digital codes that can be decrypted only by authorized users who possess unique decryption keys. With people increasingly gaining unauthorized access to email messages, email snooping, it's also important to encrypt sensitive email messages and file attachments. Now, virtual private networks, known as VPNs, have solved this problem by using software to encrypt all internet data at both ends of the transmission process. Instead of making long-distance calls, employees connect to the internet. Alternatively, many companies are now also adopting web-based secure socket layers, or SSLs, encryption to provide secure off-site access to data and programs. Finally, companies are combating security threats by hiring white-collar hackers, so-called good guys, who security test weak points in information systems so that they can be fixed. People inside organizations use three kinds of information technology to assess and share information. Executive information systems, intranets, and portals. An executive information system, an EIS, uses internal and external sources of data to provide managers and executives the information they need to monitor and analyze organizational performance. The goal of an EIS is to provide accurate, complete, relevant, and timely information to managers. Intranets are private company networks that allow employees to easily access, share, and publish information using internet software. Intranet sites are just like internet sites, but the firewall separating the internal company network from the internet permits only authorized internal access. 
Companies typically use intranets to share information, for example, about employee benefits, and to replace paper forms with online forms. Finally, corporate portals are a hybrid of executive information systems and intranets. With an EIS, managers and executives get key information that they need to monitor and analyze organizational performance. While well, Electronic Data Interchanges, or EDIs, Two companies convert purchase and ordering information to a standardized format to enable direct electronic transmission of that information from one company's computer system to the other. Web services are another way for companies to directly and automatically transmit purchase and ordering data from one company's computer system to another company's system. An extranet allows companies to exchange information and conduct transactions by purposely providing outsiders with direct, password-protected, web browser-based access to authorized parts of a company's intranet or information system. Knowledge is the understanding that one gains from information. Importantly, knowledge does not reside in information. Historically, knowledge has resided in people. That's why companies hire consultants and why family doctors refer patients to specialists. Unfortunately, it can be quite expensive to employ consultants, specialists, and experts. Expert systems are created by capturing the specialized knowledge and decision rules used by experts and experienced decision makers. They permit non-expert employees to draw on this expert knowledge base and to make decisions. Artificial intelligence, known as AI, is the capability of computerized systems to learn and adapt through experience. The feedback used in an AI system helps AI to learn and become more accurate over time.